Is Christianity harmful? You know, for almost any question you offer, you ask me, I could produce one of my books that says something to that effect. So I'm sorry if you you have you don't to have to me. give us the whole answer. We this gives us a reason to buy the, these books. But well, I mean, um, I want you to, I want you to take a look at this one. Yep. I have uh, chapters in here by scholars and atheists uh, alike, uh, uh, atheist scholars and just atheist voices alike, um, like Robert Ingersoll, Victor Stenger, Peter Buckhosian, David Eller. Uh, we have uh, chapters on uh, uh, genocide. We have chapters on the witch hunt. We have chapters on slavery. We have chapters on uh, democracy and uh, the dark ages and uh, the sanctity of life and uh, gender binary and LGBT people. And we have uh, on um, how Christianity can be heart hazardous to your health when it comes to medical procedures, the environment, um, even animals and um, women. Um, I mean, this, is, is Christianity horrible? This settles that case. If I truly am, I, I didn't write all these chapters. I wrote four of them. So I'm not just saying this. I'm saying this as a reader as well. Uh, the hell doctrine and, you know, this idea of teaching children that there's a place that God created to burn people for all eternity, but he loves you. You know, this is, so this is an old George Carlin joke. Um, I'm rehashing, but um, th this is, uh, this is a what I would consider a form of child abuse, you know, to tell children that. And in Christianity, it's viewed as a good thing, a net positive somehow, despite, you know, the psychological damage that you may be doing to people, whether they remain Christian their whole life or deconvert or whatever. You've really scarred them with one of the worst human man-made ideas. You know, th th this isn't the, the mind of... A, an all-knowing, all-good being who loves us didn't come up with this idea. So an evil man, po possibly one of the worst people who ever existed, you know, several times over, came up with this idea to instill fear into people and control. And uh, fear is is a good motivator, but it doesn't elicit any true respect. Or know? love. And, or, or love. Or love. You know, yeah, mean, it's not yeah, genuine love. Yeah, if you're supposed to love God, with all and, your uh, yeah, you, 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 all you have are threats, you know. Then, That's a uh, pretty weak God, isn't it? It is, yeah. Like, if he has to compel you, like, it's like holding a gun to your head. You will love me or I will shoot you. Well, I, I think people I think people ought to reread the book of uh, Job. First off, it's a fictitious story because uh, there's a dialogue in there that uh, is in Hebrew rhyme. And the Hebrew rhyme is where they uh, mimic the thought of the first phrase and the second phrase. It's not a rhyming in the sense that it, 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 it um, sounds the same, but it's a, it's a Hebrew poetry where they mimic the, the thought of the first verse and the second verse. So it's definitely poetry, and people do not talk in poetry when they're discussing things like the friends of Job as, they sat, as he sat in dust and was covered with boils. So it's a fictitious play. But you ought to read the, uh, the book of Job because uh, in the first chapter and in the final chapter, um, this is modeled based on the Mesopotamian Patanian king. He could do whatever he wanted to his subjects. He had spies he sent out into the people to make sure they were loyal. If they weren't loyal, loyal he would chop off their head. I mean, he could do what he wanted so long as he kept from being assassinated himself. That's, that means he had to pay attention to his royals. Uh, but this is uh, this is the God of the Bible, the one that's modeled uh, on the kings of that day. It's pretty plain. That's the God you find throughout the whole Old Testament and New Testament. The God who has subjects who war who are forced to worship him under threats, and he doles them out a few portions of this and says, you know, um, asking you to receive, and I'll give you maybe some. Um, and the, the Book of Job of, of all the books in the Bible, supposedly, is supposed to answer the problem of evil. All we have is the God of that um, of that book yelling at Job for, for not trusting him, despite the fact that Job had no reason to trust him. So it's not uh, it's a good book to read, reread it, think through. It's uh, it's it's a uh, truly barbaric what that God does and can do and did do. Yeah, and also uh, the same with Abraham as well. I, he didn't. Yeah, there's lots know, of different stories, but yeah, yeah. Abraham he didn't harm Abraham in the same way, but just the the test of 
right you know it, it boggled my mind how the bible describes these as righteous men you know and which is how they garnered god's attention in the first place abraham was deemed was seen as righteous in the eyes of the lord so he decided to test him for some reason and i never understood that does god know the answer to the test in advance and if he does then what's the point of the test and exactly. if the point of the test is to trust god why would god tell him to sacrifice his son because if a god told me that i wouldn't trust him i'd be like that, that this can't be the god exactly, exactly. That cares about people he wouldn't ask me to do that so be gone you evil demon and then he uh, should have passed the test but but he passed the test by actually trying to go through with the sacrifice which was evil so that's a failure like he should have failed the test yeah that um yeah yeah i would definitely say no no god um i really don't unless you give me some evidence that uh this is going to be um the a right thing to do uh, i'm not i'm not touching my son yeah you know? unless and, it's an and, evil god and he and really just wants your obedience and he doesn't you, care about you, you're you're pretty happy with that are you that's, that's pretty cool yeah, i mean it, it makes sense to me it doesn't make sense none of it none of this makes any sense, no the, the, but... the, the counter argument makes sense to you the right. evil god yeah yeah it does sure sure but i would say i would say if god can uh, uh judge our intentions and then none of, it, none of this is uh had to happen none of this was so he could have stayed all kinds of suffering and those who would reject him if that's uh, by the way that's questionable whether god would care whether we believed on him or not, but uh, if that's uh, somehow a value to him, then, then he could judge in, in advance whether we're going to believe, and it just not ever create the people who end up in hell in the first place, and therefore there's no occupant in the hotel hell at all. And uh, just ju by judging the intentions and, uh, oh, these persons, you know, foreknowledge, if you want, and these people can, uh, they're going to all love me, and as apparently I want, I want to be loved. And since I want to be loved, and I can judge that they're going to love me in the end, I won't even create them, I'll just bring him into heaven. No, none, none of that makes sense. None of what he did makes sense. You're right. I will say, though, there there is at least one passage in the Bible that I find to be useful. I, I don't oh, think good. that the whole thing should be thrown away. There is some useful information in there for me. Good. Test um, all things. Don't scoff at prophecies, but test them. Hold on to the ones that are good. Reject every kind of evil. And so when I apply that wisdom to the Bible itself, I can reject most of what's in there because a lot of it is evil and just hold on to the little bits and pieces that are actually good, like love thy neighbor. If it really were an important part of the Bible, then God could have emphasized it in say the 10 commandments. One of them would say, thou shalt test things and subject them to, um, you know, uh, uh, to the objective evidence and repeated that self himself over and over again and, and not up, played the uh, the first you of faith but yeah there's there some good things in the bible sure. well one of the questions that i tend to ask theists whenever we get into a uh, morality discussion it's usually with christians where you know the conversation goes to uh god's divine justice and his divine judgment and his morality and this objective morality idea which isn't really a thing um but one of the questions i tend to ask is if god was evil and saying that he's good, how would you be able to tell the difference between, a, how, how do you tell the difference between an actually good God and an evil God who's all powerful, all knowing and all present, who says that he's good? What is the, what is the test to determine one from the other? And the answer is they can't tell there, you. There is we, I know this. And Stephen Law, philosopher Stephen Law, comes up with, the, I think it's called the evil God hypothesis. And uh, it's been said before him, yeah, uh, exactly. there, there really wouldn't be anything. You can make excuses. If you can make excuses for the evil in the world, given a good God, you know, well, you know, God knows best. Uh, you know, you're, you're misinterpreting. He does free will. If you can make those same excuses to exonerate a good God, given the present evil in this world, then you, you can do the same thing. If there's an evil God, well, yeah, there's, there's goodness that exists, but you got to allow for free will. Yeah, God knows what's best. I mean, this evil God, he knows what's best. So you're using the same type of excuses to excuse an evil God as you would, you know, to excuse an, uh, a good God. So given that, there's no way you could tell. You're right. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, and also, and that's only for the Christians or the theists who are using some sort of 
measure that we actually use to determine good from evil. It's Which is the only measure we have. I mean, our, our own human standard. Right, right. And so they're using that to use that kind of argument. But then I run into Christians who say, well, no, you can't use that because your assessment of good and evil is tainted. You're a sinful fallen being. Only God, who is perfect, can truly judge good from evil. You know? So it's and really strange it's, it's really strange that this good God would create within us a, a, moral, a certain moral sense of sensibility like you know torturing children for the fun of it is bad mm -hmm. and and yet oh you know make us want to believe in him even though he says in psalm i think it's 137 happy is he who dashes babies on the rocks i think yeah. it's 137 and what that verse means is that the act of genocide is actually being completed because after after you kill all the moms and the pops and all the grandpas and the kids uh the kids uh, I mean, the, the, the young kids, then the, who's left to kill? The babies. 